So today and tomorrow are all about cranial approaches in neurosurgery. And there are a lot of them. Um, Dr. Bernardo is going to give you an exhaustive overview for the next few hours of the most common approaches and, and what you're most likely to see on a regular basis. Um, and you'll be hearing more in depth from, from the great faculty that Ryan's lined up about the most common of these approaches. But what exactly are we talking about when we speak about surgical approaches? What, what, what really is a surgical approach? In the most general sense, and for many of the approaches you'll be learning about today and tomorrow, cranial cases follow a fairly standard linear progression, beginning with patient positioning, followed by skin and muscle incision, burr hole placement, bone flap fashioning, uh, opening of the dura, uh, establishing and navigating the surgical corridor, accessing the lesion and, and debulking, decompressing, clipping, et cetera. And, and once finished, of course, closing the dura, fixing the bone flap in place and closing the muscle and skin. So, um, oops, sorry. So the approach is the technique used to reach the target of choice, be that a region, tumor, or aneurysm. Um, and generally uh, can be thought of as the opening craniotomy and corridor portion. So as, long, so as you go along and you learn each approach, you also need to spend time understanding the optimal positioning, um, for the patient positioning for each approach. And to make understanding of spatial positioning easier, it's useful to first understand some standard terms. Often when discussing patient positioning, we speak of directionality of different points on the skull, including the vertex, which is the topmost point, the nasion, which is the anterior landmark that is the bridge of the nose, and then posteriorly, the, the inion, which is the posterior landmark uh, on the tip of uh, the external occipital protuberance. So posteriorly you have the inion, anteriorly you have the nasion, up top you have the vertex, and down below, um, the mastoid tip can be very useful, which is the very bottom of the mastoid process. Additionally, we have two other important points. For anterolateral approaches, the pterion is a highly important landmark. It's the H-shaped, which you can see uh, here, the, the H-shaped uh, junction of the frontal, parietal, temporal, and sphenoid bones. And you can approximate its location uh, as two finger widths above the, zygom the zygomatic arch and one finger posterior to the frontal process of the zygomatic bone. So as you'll see shortly, the frontal temporal terional craniotomy is carefully performed around the terion and the bone flap is elevated to expose the dura and the anterior branch of the middle meningeal artery underneath. Posterolaterally, the asterion um, is found at the junction of the lambdoid, occipital mastoid, and parietal mastoid sutures, and is an extremely important landmark in the retrosigmoid approach, as it's a superficial um, indicator of the location of the sigmoid transverse sinus junction. Another point that uh, you may hear about is McCarty's keyhole. Um, especially for the orbitozygomatic or supraorbital approaches, which is a strategically placed burr hole behind the frontozygomatic suture designed to simultaneously expose the floor of the anterior cranial fossa um, and uh, the orbit. And you can see that you have your, your dura and your periorbita. Also in the anterolateral approaches, the temporal lines will be quite useful. Uh, the superior temporal line is a small ridge that extends from the posterior edge of the zygomatic process posteriorly along the lateral surface of the parietal bone. And it's, it's where the superficial temporal fascia, which uh, covers all that entire temporalis muscle, uh, attaches. Um, and the inferior temporal line splits from the superior temporal line right as it encounters the coronal uh, suture. Um, and this is where the temporalis muscle itself attaches. And these become useful to you as you dissect to preserve the frontal branch of the facial nerve um, as the anterior third of the fascia is composed of two layers separated by a fat pad. And through that fat pad is where you find the frontal branch of the facial nerve 
um, and the deep temporal vessels. But you really want to preserve that. So it's important to understand not only the fascial layers, the fat pad, where the nerve is, um, and its relationship to its attachment points um, on the skull. In the posterior approaches, the nuchal lines will also be useful to you. The nuchal lines of the occipital bone are where many muscles and ligaments of the neck and back attach to the skull. The superior nuchal line involves that the inion, which is the, the tip of the external occipital protuberance. Um, and it extends from the inion laterally um, all the way uh, in both directions, bilaterally, um, uh, to the lambdoid sutures. And it's where the trapezius, sternocleidomastoid, occipitalis and splenius capitis are attached. The inferior nuchal line is about two and a half centimeters beneath that. And it's where the obliquus capitis, superior rectus capitis, posterior major and minor muscles all attach. And in all approaches, when pinning uh, the patient in the skull clamp, um, you wanna keep the pins near the regions of the superior temporal and nuchal lines where there's a, a good amount of muscle. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.